Welcome back to another episode of the Juan Juan Podcast. I'm your host as always, Juan. Make sure to follow the show on social media at the Juan on Juan Podcast on any on any major social media platform, tjojp.com. And YouTube, if you're listening to this on the RSS feed, leave a five-star review, comment, like, subscribe, wherever, share with your friends and family. And today I'm excited to present to you all, do you want me to call you Steve or Steven? Steve is great, whatever you like. We have Steve Ross with us, and he's got an interesting story to tell us. Steve, where can people find your work, firstly, and and your books and all that? Well... My main uh, website is www.lesscomplicated.net, all one word. I have my books and posts I've done over the years on internet. Uh, My website for my actual business uh, for the alternative medicine is www.wrf.org, stands for World Research Foundation. Awesome. And also in the background there, that's a real background. That's not a green screen for those wondering, correct, Steve? Juan, that's so funny because every time I do a podcast, when I moved, the people kind of gasped. No, it is the library here. There's 20,000 volumes dating to 1492 on alchemy, ancient philosophy, metaphysics, occult, uh, psychology science it is real and this is your website for those that want to check it out less complicated than now post all the links after the show send me the link steve and i'll post those all in the description thank you people can just click on those and they can check it out but yeah definitely you that's a real background and steve there's something about everyone can go on here and check out your books so make sure everyone check that out we're going to be talking about today about manly p hall's unpublished pages of the secret teachings of all ages and steve had the opportunity to work with manly p hall so we're going to be getting into that but steve there's something about books i have a friend of mine who has a metaphysical and esoteric bookstore down in south florida i'm in i'm in central florida and we've done a couple shows there and whenever i'm in there it feels like do you feel smarter, Steve, by just being around the books? Do you, does it do they resonate at a certain frequency to where you're kind of absorbing that? There is an energy with books, and I, I want to give you a little background, Juan, on this room. This room is patterned after rooms built during the Renaissance era in the 1500s, where you immerse yourself in total beauty. When I built this room 23 years ago, I played music 24 hours a day, for seven years. I have a CD with 300 um, classical music, and I played that day and night to set the tone, the vibration of this room. And yes, I agree with you. There's something about uh, the energy of these books, and this room is alive. A lot of these authors are in this room, their vibrational patterns, I know I can say anything I would like on your podcast here. Uh, there is a reality to that energy uh, that that is in this room. Now, it's interesting because every once in a while I have people come and go, uh, Steve, books are great. Don't you hate your iPhone? Well, my iPhone here is holding 4,000 books. It's one terabyte, but the vibrations in this versus this is quite different. So I completely agree with you. Um, this room is alive and people will feel it when they when they actually come in. Absolutely. And re- speaking of books, I want to give a shout out to Ronnie Pontiac. I'm going to plug his book, Amer- yes. American Metaphysical Religion, for setting this up. Ronnie's a super cool guy. I did an episode with him. I forgot which which number it is, but everyone go check that out. Ronnie Pontiac. American metaphysical religion. Shout out to him. And Steve, before we dive into your origin story, because you have an interesting origin story, I, I just, the idea I've called, I have this thing that I've dubbed it. It's called this theory that I have. Usually people who have the largest libraries in the world, for example, John D, 
they tend to be very powerful. And I have this idea of like, if you look at a Jeff Bezos, which kind of sort of Amazon started selling books, that that's essentially what they started out as. And if we want to get technical, he would right now, he's one of the number one companies in the world. He has essentially one of the largest collections of books, right? Cause I mean, they sell it on the platform. And I think that, right. There's something about, I call it interdimensional literature that there's books that resonate throughout centuries. I mean, look at, right. Let's take the one that everyone knows about the Bible, right? Yes. The King James Bible, the original 1611 one, and how that has transformed reality as we know it even today. Do you have any thoughts on that as, as to, cause I believe that the art of writing things down, like when I journal or when I take notes by hand, there's something how you're saying, there's something personal about reading the actual physical book and having that experience smelling. I always, when people on my channel, they know that I open books and I take a good whiff of them because, you know, I, I, I like to feel it, smell it. And there's something about that experience that really solidifies it in this reality, this perceivable reality, at least. Right. Absolutely. And uh, it's not unusual visitors who have come in and go around this library, because as I mentioned, the books are from the 1490s, 1500s, the alchemical books are 15, 16, 1700s. There is something very strong uh, vibrationally. And that's why I said, because of what I have here, because of what I've created, there is a dome with a portal here. Uh, the the vibrations are alive. And those who know me, who have spent time, they understand that. And when I've done other presentations, I will bring the busts of some of these authors to a lecture. And when I begin the lecture, I will actually hear these busts, even though they're busts, sharing the information from that philosopher with me and the the written books that some of them have because some of these people pythagoras they didn't have written books they had par parchments they had some scrolls those are all alive and i will tell you during this broadcast about my experience in a, in a castle of a very famous alchemist where there was a trunk wand with parchments and scrolls dating to 12 and 1300, way before written books, there was so much energy in just touching these. So it it is something I think that's very, very important. We're going to talk about dreams later, but I need to share something apropos to your question. And that is, uh, over the years, I'm 74 now since I was 23. I've been guided great, by Steve. dreams. <laughs> but um, when I go to bed, I have a legal size pad next to me. And for a while, uh, I was doing that. And I said, geez, I get tired of writing because I would have a dream wand, turn the page, never open my eyes, write, and then go to sleep. So I thought, you know what? I'm just going to have a, a recording machine there. Well, it absolutely didn't work because when I tried to speak my dream as I was having it, I couldn't do it. But when I'm writing it down, I would have sometimes six dreams a night, sleep perfectly. There is something to the written word uh, even, and the reason I'm sharing this is, obviously there's a point or place within our conscious mind, within our brain, where I could write, but I couldn't speak the dreams as I was having them. So uh, there are some great books that have been handed down for eons. Um, some of them started originally as word, mouth to ear, and then recorded, and then finally they were written down. I'm thinking of a book called The Kabbalion, which is a very, very famous hermetic text. So I agree with you. And I wouldn't have a library like this if I didn't have this resonance with books. And Steve, can people go and visit you there at that library? 
Uh, right now, not. It's more by by invitation only. This has happened since the the COVID times. Mm. Um, but if somebody contacts me and we talk, there is a good good possibility that they they can visit. You of course have an open says me card. You you have an open invitation anytime. And uh, we go case by case. We like to know what people are looking for and whether or not we really have. But I'd like to share a quick story. I had a visitor in here and was talking about the books and the subjects and everything was great. And this woman was almost fainting. It was unbelievable. And she was here with a little 10-year-old girl, her daughter. And the little girl, after I stopped talking, says, where is your section on pirates? I said, I don't have a section on pirates. It was a humbling experience because her mother was going, oh, my God, you have everything here. And I was puffed up going, yes, we do. But we don't have a pirate section. <laughs> there's always, right, there's always going to, you can't please everybody, especially <laughs> when you're out in the limelight. So that there just comes go. to show. And. Can you tell us, I've heard a little bit of your origin story, Steve, and, and one more thing, because I love talking about books. The idea, have you ever heard of Pythagorean palaces? Because I know you mentioned Pythagoras earlier. Pythagorean palaces. I, I haven't heard that terminology. I'm very familiar with Pythagoras and his writings, and but I have not heard that. So there's this book. Let me I got it here. And and you spoke about portals. Yes. And I had I had a, a listener tell me one time. Never mind. I thought that was the book. It's a different book. Anyways. There's <laughs> so many books. I don't know which one's which. But I had a listener tell me one time that because I do a lot of research, I do a lot of reading here in my area. This is my my room. Yes. And she told me that wherever you do stuff like this, you do open up a sort of portal. Is you know the and things can, can Absol yes. come through. Yeah, absolutely. And along with that, um, Paracelsus said that there is a foci, F-O-C-I, or corresponding place within every human being to everything outside in the macrocosm in the universe. And if you want to attach, learn, or go to any subject, if you go to that foci, that corresponding point within your own self, you will be aligned with everything that has ever been said, written, discussed, or thought about on that topic. So if somebody's into some form of engineering and they get to that foci within their own being, that will, like a tuning fork, resonate with everything in the cosmos that has ever been discussed on that topic. So whether that is exactly, Juan, what you were talking about, to me, those are those portals that will take you to any dimension and also any topic or subject that has ever existed from ancient times to the present and the future. Plato, I believe, was the one that said that we are all remembering. We know everything already. I, I love it. It is not about learning anything new. It is about remembering. And this goes along with some of the hermetic and yogic teaching that it isn't that you're here to acquire. You're here to eliminate the superfluous attachments that you've picked up from living after living after living. Now, I'm hearing thunder and lightning and it's starting to rain i'll cross my fingers that you and i continue but if something happens it's it's fine yeah it happens here a lot of these afternoon florida thunderstorms get yes, very very and bad. it's our monsoon season here yeah. but uh no uh, plato was right and there is a yogic story having to do with this and that is the yogis say Everybody comes in with a light within that is covered by many sheets or blankets. As you come into the living, when you have an experience, you and I have an experience together, it may be so outstanding for you that three or four sheets are removed for you 
Maybe I don't get it as well, only one covering. And as you have living after living, there are fewer and fewer of these blankets or sheets over this inner light until you start seeing this dawning. You start seeing this small pinhole of light. And the reason they're using that is nobody gives you the light or the spirituality. We have it. And as you brought it up, we eliminate those coverings that we've acquired over livings, over time, so that our light is shining. That is why, personally, I don't have any gurus. I, I will listen. I've never joined any group organization. I can admire people. But the greatest guru you and I have is inside of you and inside of me. Absolutely. Amen to that. And one other thing before you get to your to your origin story, Steve, you mentioned earlier that you bring out these busts sometimes of these philosophers and writers and you feel that they're talking to you as sometimes. I mean, that's not too far fetched because the ancients, right, the Egyptians with the opening of the mouth ceremony and the Mesopotamians, I think they I forgot what they called it, but they called it something similar. And I'm known as the homunculus guy in my in my community. I covered that subject a lot. And that's kind of sort of right the alchem right speaking of Paracelsus, which we'll get into here in a little bit, but the, the yes. homunculus, this little divinator, this little thing that you would create, this alchemical creation that would divinate to you. And essentially that's what the ancients were doing. They were invoking at times spirits into these inanimate objects. And I mean you have Albertus Magnus and the the brazen head and Bacon and all those guys. Yes. I mean, that's not too far fetched, Steve, because people start to look outside of the this mundane reality for answers. I mean, look at John D with Edward Kelly, right? Yes, <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll share a little bit more on that lecture, which was titled "Would the Philosophy of the Ancients Be Pertinent in Today's World?" So I brought the busts of Ralph Waldo Emerson, Paracelsus, and Pythagoras. So I had them on a table behind me, and I did it here in Sedona. There was a, about 300 people in attendance, and I would bring up a subject, and then I, each one of the bus were talking to me. So I had to go and say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. And I, I listened to Emerson. I listened <laughs> to Paracelsus. So when it was over, people came up and went, gosh, I think those bus were really talking to you. And I go, they were. They were talking. And they were so excited, seriously. When I was driving over to the lecture center, I looked in my mirror and the, the bus were sitting in the back seat. I already knew, Juan, that, they, that there was an energy there. They were alive. But about three quarters into the lecture, I had to shut them up because they were all three of them were talking to me at the same, wait a minute, hold on, I'll get to you. And then I spoke, so yes. I believe very strongly in this. Is there, where can we find, do you have those lectures published, Steve? You know, I, I contacted these people. This was going back to 2000 and I, I wish it had been. I actually contacted the organizer not too long ago and they, they didn't do that. So That's it would have been yeah. nice. Yeah, if you, if you can, because I looked on online and I, f I found a couple of your interviews, but uh, there wasn't really a lot of lectures. I'd be interested if you ever do get a hold of that. And how does one go about, Steve, right? To How do you how do you get into this sort of stuff and how do you go about collecting such a massive library like you have in, in, in the background there? How do you get into this sort of subject? Because I always make the mistake that I think everyone is into this sort of topic matter and and not a lot of people are into this subject right the esoteric or the occult or alchemy and when i meet someone who is also as passionate and as knowledgeable as me in these subjects i get all excited but how'd you go how'd you start off what's your story a little bit like steve jeez that is so open-ended but let me start there there are two streams that i am a part of one is alternative medicine one is the esoteric and alchemical and the um, health started from the standpoint that I was on scholarship at my university, Cal State Northridge in uh, the Los Angeles area. 
I sustained a knee injury because a gardener had left a sprinkler head uh, in our running track. I was sent to the sports physician for the Rams, Dodgers, and Lakers, uh, Dr. Curlin, who said I couldn't run without, compete without surgery. So I was very dejected, but I was sent to UCLA for a second opinion. And I am of the age that Kareem <laughs> Jabbar was playing for John Wooden. So I'm dating myself. You're a young guy. But Kareem was at UCLA and Ducky Drake said, you have to have surgery. I was very dejected. I went back to my trainer's room. Uh, there was a popular mechanics magazine sitting next to a whirlpool. Had nothing to do popular mechanics with medicine, but I found a technique in there. I called Dr. Curlin. I said, do you think this would work? This was uh, 1968. He said, that's alternative garbage. That will never work. I used it myself, missed six weeks of training, and that year finished fifth in the United States, small college for my events. So I planted a seed for me, which is the bulk of this library. Whether there are things exist in medicine that you and I are not told about, and that started my trail in alternative medicine. Now, four years later, I meet a Native American Cherokee Indian who tells me all my future guidance will come in my dreams. And I thought, well, this is silly. Not only do I not remember dreams, but when if I have a dream, it is so stupid or silly, it makes no sense. But I went one week without sleeping because I was so anxious, and I'm such a silly guy to have my dream that I, I couldn't get to sleep. One week later, I finally get to sleep. And the first dream that comes is this. I hear a voice. I see a finger point. I'm just using this book. What kind of animal is Steve pointing to that animal? Well, I recognized the voice. It was a friend of mine from my volleyball years. I thought, boy, that wasn't very nice, that animal. So I called this fellow up. His name was Bob. I said, hey, Bob, is there anything bothering you about me? He goes, what? What are you talking about? I asked a second time, anything bothering you? No, I ask a third time, what's your problem? I don't know why. This was 1973. I was only 24. I want to be a better person. Steve, there is something bothering me. My heart sank, Juan. I said, what? You remember we played on our six-man volleyball team, but we had seven people? Yes. Do you remember what you did to Harold, our seventh player, every time he came in? I, I said, no. He said, every time Harold would make a mistake, you would look at him. You never said anything. And when, this is Bob still talking, when Harold and I went out for pizza later, he threw up because he couldn't win your approval, and I thought you were a real hog. That picture book was a hog. And I sat there after I hung up, and I go, what the heck? Bob never intimated, never said a word. After that, I had six dreams every night for four months on every phase of my personality, my likes and dislikes, commentary on philosophers. And then I started getting telephone numbers, just a telephone number. The next morning, I would look because I told you I wrote them down on a legal pad. It was like, what the heck do I do with this? So here's how clever a guy was. I, I'm going to call and ask for Jim. So I call up the numbers and I go, is Jim there? And a voice would say, we're waiting for you. We have stuff for you. Now, if you and I met at a party and you didn't see this background, you would go, well, you wouldn't because I think you, you meet so many people. But Let's face it, an average person would go, yeah. what kind of cock and bull story? Well, this has been accumulated through following dreams, being given information, having telephone numbers, going to different parts of the world, and having people say, we want you to caretake this. So 
If I had not called up Bob, if I had not followed that first dream, would my life be the same one? Possibly and possibly not, but I made a commitment. So that is <laughs> the story of how it started. Now, what's come through in the dreams over the years, where it has led me, and a reoccurring dream like this. Strangely enough, I'm in a library. There's a line of people. At the front of the line is a man on a podium looking down. I come in the dream, and he goes, we would now like you to study Paracelsus. We would now like you to study names that I had never heard of. And that's been my reoccurring dream over 50 years. Who, so first, Steve, who, when you would call these numbers, the people would acknowledge you and give you more information? We're waiting for you. We have something for you, Stephen. <laughs> they would call my name. That's why I went, I have a PhD in finance and business. My dad was from Lockheed Aircraft. Everything in my upbringing was fact, fact, fact. Dreams, they have no meaning. My dad used to say before he started understanding about my dreams. Here's a dream. I have a dream to go to the Bodhi Tree Bookstore in Hollywood, California. It was very famous in my neck of the woods in the LA area. In the dream, I was told to go to the used book section, to go to a particular bookcase, reach my hand behind the books on the third shelf, and there would be a book there. Now, at the time, I was hunting down information on color therapy and a practitioner named Dinsha Gadiali from the early 1900s. So I go there, and there's a book, New Light on Therapeutic Energies, written in the 60s by Mark Gallard. I read it, and I go, yes. Three chapters later is Royal R. Rife, the Universal Rife Microscope, which I don't know if you're familiar, but it's one of the most incredible stories and microscopes ever built. And within one year, I end up having this extremely rare microscope that was built in the 1920s. And the doctors from the Mayo Clinic, Northwestern, USC, John Hopkins, discovered frequencies to destroy 60 of 60 different including it's an unbelievable story. But because the dream told me to go and get this book through a whole sequence of events, perhaps on a future show, if you're really interested, because the rife microscope and rife frequencies are very famous, but 99% of the people who talk about it on the internet don't know what they're talking about, have never seen it, and no one on the internet knows where this microscope is. So the dreams have given me the open sesame, which you will see when we get to Manly Hall. And I'm the sorry, I, I, I seem to go on and on. So no, no, I'm you're, apologize. Good. you're good, Steve. The, the people on the other end of that phone call, were, were you dreaming when you were making that phone call? Were you, no, were, were no. they human? Of course. They were did human you follow beings. up after like we got stuff for you go okay where do i pick it up or they hang up or no I, I called here's what happened <clears throat> i would have the yellow legal pad writing dreams but other times it was just a phone number then i wake up the next morning i see this phone number it's like so i physically call those numbers at first asking for jim what else am i going to do i don't know and the voice on the other side would say, Steve, we're waiting for you. They knew who, they knew it was me. They were human beings. They were live. And they told me where they were located in the world. And when I went there, I was given materials. What? So yeah. you would meet up with these people, Steve? Yes, I, I have to. Juan, if I told you this story like I was doing... 
Like for those that that think <laughs> this One, is two. it's CGI, Steve. It's a deep fake. <laughs> This has materials, parchments, lost are in this library. I mean, you don't have enough time because I would be like a gnome jumping up and down, bringing stuff to your screen here. <laughs> and I don't know if you would so, like that, but it's we endless. Can we can we can do another episode after this one steve because you you've got a lot to unpack but i, I want to get to so you had your your injury when you were right, you, were, you were training yes you 19. you unlock some some right you you found some alternative things and alternative methods you tried it out it worked so yeah. that unlocked in you what else am i missing what else is being occulted well, because of that I went around the world finding what exists for arthritis, diabetes, all the that Western is not giving us the full story about. And mm -hmm. that was my main area and profession at World Research Foundation was, why are we not being told about electricity? Why are we not being told? And in those years in the 60s, there wasn't too much on acupuncture and uh, biofeedback was just starting. But um, in this library, I made connections with people all over the world and went to the jungles in Bali or prestigious institutes in Germany, finding out what, what are you doing and discovering that there was a disconnect. Here it is surgery radiation, pharmaceuticals, chemotherapy, but over in other parts of the world, it's herbs and magnetism and electricity. And so that's what came from that particular um, stream is alternative medicine and eventually World Research Foundation. It's not known, World Research Foundation is known for its holdings of alternative medicine. And for many, many years, the first 30 years, I, I didn't really integrate the spiritual. I was trying to be so solid. So when I would came, come in front of doctors, they wouldn't go, oh, you are a hokey. You're into spirits and this and fear. So I kept it. And slowly over the years, as I came out of my have to be perfect for the medical profession, spirituality started coming more and more. But my spiritual river stream was always there. But that is where the less complicated comes in. And my YouTube channel with, I've got about 130 videos on my YouTube channel. I didn't give that. For me, this isn't about promoting myself, it's about promoting the topic that I'm passionate about, alchemy, hermetic, dreams, that, that is more important. And in your experience, Steve, because I, I had issues too, and there's the, the Pythagorean recollection method to remember yes. dreams and it's it's remembering your day backwards yep. and i have an, i have another method it's kind of unorthodox and i won't I, it's kind of crude so i won't bore you with it but the idea because i whenever i indulge in the electric lettuce right or the devil's lettuce if, if you know what i mean right the the, the stuff i don't dream right i, I can't remember my dreams so I've been sober for some months now, and, and the reason I, I became sober was to be able to dream. Now, my dreams after getting off, I'll wait a week or so, they are so vivid, Steve. They are so vivid that I often wonder if the people on the other side that I was dreaming of, real life people, if they are dreaming of me or if I'm in their dream and interacting with them. And with that being said, 
what are your opinions? Because I have my own ideas about the dream state or the dream world. I think it's another reality, almost like a sort of mundus imaginalis, right? Henry Corbin. Parallel universes, parallel dimensions, simultaneous lives. All, all of that is, is possible. Um, I've written a book. People can find it. It's called A Grand Design of Dreams, where I discuss you know, what you're asking here. Uh, by the way, um, since I love the way you and I are able to flow, I, I, I want to interject a little story about perspective. Yeah, go ahead. Aristotle was walking along the banks of the Mediterranean when he spotted in the distance a figure with a bucket, putting it in the Mediterranean and then putting it in a hole on the bank. And when he came up to the man, it was the village madman. So Aristotle says to this man, what are you doing? And the man says, I am going to empty all of this water so I can see the blue-green bottom. So Aristotle says to him, how are you going to get all of that water into that little hole that you have? And the man looked at him and kind of scratched his head and said, great philosopher, what are you doing? And Aristotle says, I am contemplating the universe. And the man says to him, how are you going to get all of that into that little head of yours? Everything is perspective. So, Juan, what I share is only my perspective from my experience. And in no time am I a person who goes, what I say is the gospel, because it may be for me, but it may not be for you or any of your viewers. So going along with what we're talking about now, I have kept dream journals for 50 years. What I noticed on these dream journal on the dreams was over the long haul, I could pigeonhole them into different topics. I was getting an education in eight or nine different areas over 50 years. I may not have thought about that, nor have I heard other people talk. You get a dream, you interpret it. Forget it. You get a dream, you interpret. One night, had, and it was when I had my seven dreams a night, I was sitting in a barber's chair. And this is a dream. And I could hear people say, okay, what is the sequence of dreams we're going to give Stephen tonight? It was unbelievable. And then I had those dreams that night. And I was going, somebody let me view to where my, quote, dreamer was, where particular dreams were being picked out. I have also had dreams where I have seen my own past lives, and I knew it was me, even though I was dreaming, because it wasn't physically me, but my eyes were the same, and the energy was the same. And I was taken in these dreams to Paracelsus's life and Pythagoras's life, where, forget the books, I love books, but in these dreams with them, I, I was given, and I, I'm trying to explain it without stuttering, I, I was given a feeling of them and their time and what was going on, and it wasn't like somebody 500 years writing about Pythagoras or Plato. They don't know. It's just a book somebody writes thinking or feeling they know. My dreams have allowed me to be there. Now, here's the question. Who or what is giving me these dreams? And am I aware? And I would say it has depended on the context of the dream. Because Paracelsus has been a spirit that introduced itself to me at 29 years old in my dream one-on-one, -on -one, where I was there and he explained things, and he explained things beyond his books, and he explained things beyond the philosophy I knew. Now, can I ever say that that was 100% the gospel? I gave you my little story. I can only go by the alchemical aspects I've been able to do 
and manipulate matter based on what I was told, based on what I was shown, affecting the wind, affecting matter, by locating. I'm being very open. Normally, I never do this on shows, but I looked at your background. <laughs> I love it because the sky is the limit on your shows and people can say stuff. It's not saying that you agree or anybody else agrees, but we can talk here. All of those things I've been able to do based on following the guidance not given by any earth plane teacher. And now, am I special? No. Am I the only one who dreams like this? No. Everybody can do this. I wanted this show to put this in the realm of consciousness for you and your listeners. Gosh darn it, if he can do it, a crazy guy, I can do it also. And that's what I believe. That's what spirits have told me. Everything I share with you, everybody else can do this. Why not? They don't do what Nike did. Just do it. Believe it. Know it. Understand it. And you can do it. Have your pick at any of the major religions. And a lot of them were, they came to be because of divine intervention or because they got told by a spirit or an entity or something. And right, even H.P. Lovecraft, one of the m most influential writers, although a product of his time, right? But one yeah. of the most influential writers who was having inspirations through his dreams. Now, I have a little bit of a, an idea, my own interpretation as to what could have been trying to give him those ideas to manifest because again the art of writing is a sort of manifestation because it goes from the aether right the the theory of forms this area we yes. get an idea well who's giving us that idea is it is it something beyond our interpretation and a lot of people have to understand that alchemy is when you achieve that magnum opus one of one of the various magnum opus you are able to step outside of space and time. And you're making me think because have you ever heard of a book? It's from 1694. And I, and I have this other, I have this other show, Steve, that I love, I'd love for you to go on it. It's called the occult book club. And it's with a, with paranoid American, my, my co-host on that show. And we talk about occulted literature and we've stumbled across a lot of various interesting books and what we do is we read them and we break them down on air so i'd love to have you on there for for an occult book right that's lesser known but there's this book called a the voyage to the world of cartesius by gabriel daniel from 1694 i believe have you ever read that book have you ever heard of that book it's the first book ever to use the term outer space in the sci-fi sense have you ever heard uh, can of you book? give me the can you give me the title one more time a the voyage to the world of Cartesius, or a voyage, I think it is. A, let me let me look it up here real quick. A voyage to the world of Car uh, me and paranoid Americans chant video on YouTube is the only video ever in existence on YouTube in regards to this book. It's called A Voyage to the World of Cartesius, originally in French, translated in English, and is from sixteen. 90 so it was printed and sold by thomas bennett 1692 gabriel daniels 1649 to 1728 yeah so it's i want to say it's again 17th century late 17th century let, and let me, yes go ahead in that in that book because right you have the exoteric and the esoteric now whatever they the bs that they feed the regular people who choose and i always encourage people to to do their own research, even on my show. And, and people who listen to the show, Steve, they're pretty open-minded and, and yes. they're, they're pretty smart individuals. So they know, you know, where, where to look for certain things. And the people who choose to dig deeper, right, they're going to find. Now, in this book, I it's supposed to be fiction, quote unquote. But Louis, right, George, Louis Borges, who talks about fiction and how fiction isn't bound to the restrictions of reality. So in, in fiction, right, you have occultists like Aleister Crowley who wrote fictional books, fictional, 
but based on a true story. So they're using, they have real occult knowledge in these stories. Yes. And I believe it compounds that effect that it's supposed to have in it. And it really amplifies that. So this, this book, A Voyage to the World of Cartesius, I believe we stumbled across a, a grimoire of some, of some sorts. And the story goes that René Descartes, the famous philosopher, Yes. I think, therefore, I am the one that introduced the mind-body dualism, right? Cogito ergo sum. He had figured out a way, Steve, to project his consciousness and travel to other worlds. And in these other worlds in outer space, there would be worlds of philosophers, Aristotle, Plato. And it's funny because when you look at the craters on the moon and the people that they're named after, some of those figures are in that book. And it gets into, again, the alchemical creations of galaxies and and stars and other worlds and other realities, almost like this cosmic library of Alexandria, almost, right? And if, and if right, for those who are into this sort of topic, you, right, you have the, the simulation hypothesis that reality is a simulation. Well, Morpheus in the movie The Matrix, Morpheus is what? the god of dreams their ship is named the nebuchadnezzar what happened with Nebuchadnezzar? he had a dream right he had martin luther king was it martin luther king i have a dream was that the one that said that and it's, yes. it's just an interesting concept and whenever i'm doing research and i'll piece together ideas from various places that i've read right and i, and I love i love connecting the dots some would say that the dots aren't there to be connected but I think it's all connected, Steve. I think that synchronicity, Ron, dreams, and all these things are... The hairs are standing up on my arms, and that's a hard thing to do because I've seen and heard a lot. <clears throat> no. Everything you're sharing makes absolute, perfect, perfect sense. Uh, I thank you because I, I have not heard about this book. I will see what can be done, but... I did something, I, I did a post uh, at Less Complicated called, Are They Geniuses or Just Good Listeners? And I took all of the people through history who have credited dreams with finalizing their Nobel Prize, uh, Kipling f finishing poems and stories, talking about if they didn't have that answer through a dream, if they did not get that poetry through a dream, they would have never written it. But I, and I'm not leaving you, I am bouncing back to get a dream book. He's fetching a book. For those listening on the audio version. He has returned. A, yeah, he's, he has returned. What is that, Steve? Let me, let this me pull you up here. This is the first printed book ever printed on dream, on dream interpretation it is from 1539, and although dream interpretation goes back to 2000 BC, this little dog-eared book was the first <clears throat> physically printed book on dream interpretation. It is so old that it says, if you have a dream that you're flying on Pegasus or you're having dinner with du Zeus and Diana, this is what it means. It was written by Artemidorus in 200 AD. And again, this book is from 1539. You're, you're in the area that I love with the dreams and what is possible. That is why I said, uh, <clears throat> I have new gurus on this earth plane. Dreams, the foci I mentioned earlier that Paracelsus talked about, the dreams are our direct contact. <clears throat> excuse me, with not only our higher self, our oversoul, our over self, depending if you follow Paul Brutton or Ralph Waldo Emerson, the spirit guides around us, the angelic beings, the archetypes, it'll come through your dreams. If you ask, and as Paracelsus said in, I believe, 1520, you want to know about an herb? Sit cross-legged in front of it, ask what you want, and listen. The difficulty in today's world, the air is being sucked out of everything with the politics. 
is people are outside and outside and outside, Juan, instead of internal and listening and bypassing all this BS that's going out that everybody thinks is so important. Today will be here, tomorrow it won't. This guy's in, then he's out. But our inner life is always there. And the dreams are our direct connection to everything. It was said, everything resides in the thought stream of God. I believe Einstein was the one who said that. And everything in our world will come. You look around your office, everywhere. Everything first came into somebody's mind in this physical reality before it was manifested. Now, where the heck did that come from? It comes from them apprehending, comes from them listening. So the, dr the dreams are the portal. Who is on the other side? I, again, share only mine. I know exactly who they are. They introduce themselves. Then they give me the information. Everybody can do this if you put it in your consciousness that it is possible. And I've been given permission, not, I'm using the word permission, to be more out there and tell people the reality so now it is in their consciousness. Emerson said, when I come across narrow viewpoints, I find narrow reading. You and I love this because it's about books. And therefore, if somebody's whole world, uh, think of an encyclopedia. If everybody's whole world is the letter N, that's all they know. And someone says, Paracelsus, oh, yeah. you got to go, oh, there's a P, oh, there's a Q, oh, there's an A. It's about increasing our awareness, doing exactly what you just said about this book. Is it 100% real? Well, think about this. When somebody reaches a state of enlightenment and they're, a Buddha, they're Buddhist, they're going to see Buddha, or somebody's going to see Jesus, or somebody's going to see Moses, or Krishna, or we're always colored by our environment and our background. I'm not saying it's wrong, but the personification of the energy pattern will come in a way that we can relate to. But the more open we are, where we go, you know what? I love all the religions and philosophies, but it's an energy pattern. And by this, I mean, I've, I've been witness to people going, here's the deal. It's spirit, soul, body. No, no, it's soul, spirit, body. Steve, what do you think? I think there's three levels, and I don't care if you call the first one spirit or soul, and this, you're talking three and three. It's getting open. It's about unlearning. It's about cutting away the superfluous barnacles on, on our ship, our physical body, our brain, that, that we keep closing everything up. What is my religion? I'm a, I'm a spiritist. I believe in the spirit world, but I don't, I'm spiritual, but not religious. I love them all. I have the materials. If I'm with Buddhists, I'll speak about Buddha. If I'm with Christians, I'll take about Jesus and the Bible. But even with that, it's limiting us, Juan, in my opinion. I, when it comes to religion, I was raised in a religious household, and I think that it's people's religion is just whatever they're being taught hyper-focused on one aspect of history. So if you're Buddhist, again, that you look at it from the Buddhist perspective. If you're Christian, you look at it from the Christian perspective. And I think that everyone's right. Steve, I just think that the puzzle's all jumbled up. I think I think that I think history has it. There are again. There's there's gonna be lies. There's gonna be manipulation. There's gonna be all that. But I think that everyone has the puzzle. It's just all jumbled up, and and they haven't quite figured it out. And I don't know if we ever will. I mean, I think there's a lot of division, and right the, the state of how everything is. 
and, and various communities, not just the, the alternative thought community, but in all community, everyone's divided. Yes. You're saying, I think that everyone is, is so outside of themselves. Every, everyone's living, but not living in the moment. And I mean, you see that with technology and you see that with a whole bunch of different things, but so you have these cycle pumps that that's kind of sort of they're they're guiding you through your dreams. So cycle pumps, right? I mean, I, I know it's not the correct term of I don't know what a guide would be in in the dream realm, but these huh. these are there seven of them? Are there are there seven different ones? Are there are there nine or are they eight? Steve, how many are there? <laughs> I, I I think in our little finite minds, we, we don't know all the strata, and uh, I can tell you that. When, when I lecture, I, I never use notes, and I hear I hear what I'm going to say about 10 seconds before I need to say it. So I'm just like those other guys. I'm a good listener. doesn't mean that I'm clever or smart. I just try to be a good listener and uh, go along. You know, Juan, Pythagoras, <clears throat> Pythagoras is credited with saying, when I come across those I meet and we share information, I call them brother and sister. When I come across those that I impart information to, I call them son and daughter. And when I come across those who share to me, I call them mother and father at any time, which you have even been in our show. You're my brother. You're my daddy. You may be my son from moment to moment, person to person. And so the wisdom comes in the journey. The wisdom for me does not come out of any book. It comes from being in the moment. You just said it, so I'm taking it from you. By being in the moment mm -hmm. and understanding and being as open as possible in that moment to what is taking place. And the more clear you are, the more open you become, the more input that you receive, the more awareness, the more understanding. Spirits have told me, you were down here, not me, but we are all down here to demonstrate how we are going to use our creative energy, which is inherent in us. That does not mean you could only have to be an artist or a singer or whatever. When you walk, are you planting seeds or are you causing ground swells? How are you utilizing the creative energy that you came in with? It's a schoolroom. And there are, there's a lot of people, especially in my area in Sedona. Here's what they say. <clears throat> Magically, the awareness is going to come. Everybody's going to be enlightened. That's the equivalent of going to an elementary school and saying, you are now a college. It just doesn't work like that. Yeah. And within the first to sixth grade, you know, I've been out of school so long, I don't know if it's still first through sixth, but you have third and fourth and fifth graders. And then you have new souls that are constantly coming in from other dimensions, other planets. And... I'm not going to be anybody's judge because this may be their first time in this frame of reference. But it's a schoolroom. The ancients said that it is a schoolroom of learning. Even the great Plato said this. Every once in a while, he took his students to a little knoll overlooking his academy. And here's what he said I always want you to have a higher perspective of anything you might hear, even if, if it's from me. And speaking of experience, right? The person that, that I know you had the opportunity to, to work with, and I believe it's in the initiate to the flames from 1925 or something like that. 1924. One of his first works, Manly P hall talks about how, Right. The alchemist's cave has been replaced by four walls and right. The body is the alchemical lab and we yes. are the philosopher's stone. And through experience, that philosopher's stone 
gets its facets, right? It's chipped away and formed. It's, it's malleable and through experience. And is that a bust of Manly P. Hall over uh, by, on your side there? Who is that? Uh, that is a good friend of mine, Goethe. People oh, okay, here okay. call him Goethe, but it's... I, I call him... <laughs> I got corrected the other day for for calling him the wrong thing. And, and it's funny you mentioned that because I was just... Lit- <laughs> I was just literally going to ask you, because this is a question I've talked to my friends about before, because we're talking about the acquirement of knowledge and how right, you need to, exp- you can read, you can read a million books. And if you don't understand it or, or apply the wisdom that you get from those books, they mean nothing. And I mean, Correct. look at Faust, right? The, yes. the Faustian pact, the deal with the devil. Are you, would you, Steve, if, right, let's say you had the opportunity and they came to you and they said, hey, Steve. For the price of your soul, would you, you are able to know all the knowledge in the world. Like, like a John D he got so t- he, he thought he knew it all. He's like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to seek a bu- beyond reality for the secrets of reality. Right. I, I want some divine intervention. Would you accept that offer? If, if you had the opportunity, like, Hey, snap of a finger and you're going to have all the knowledge to ever exist, Steve. But you got to give up your soul. You got you to give it up. I mean, that's the only way. Now, you've semi put me on the spot because I'm going to sound egotistical. I'm going to say, <laughs> what the hell does this guy think he is? Um, I, w- I don't have to do that because I was shown <laughs> that we already have that. And the more open I am, I don't have to sell my soul. I am a triple Aquarian. I'm a goofball. I give lectures with paper airplanes and water balloons. And if somebody said, okay, you're going to have to give up your sense of humor, I, I, I may give that some kind of thought. But no, we do not have to give up our soul. To me, when you talk about the devil and the soul, you're talking about the material, physical world. You're talking about an undeveloped, ego and personality, but a spiritualized ego and personality has instant to all awareness, all information, all everything. And Goethe, which I am very close with, and when I say mentor, people are going to go, how old does this dude think he is? But you know what I'm talking about. Goethe and Paracelsus are my two main companions for the last 50 years through dreams, through visions. We do not have to do that. But the pact is that we give away this this negativity that we have, and we have all the knowledge. So would I do that? I personally would not. And maybe we can save some people in your audience who may be contemplating that. The best way is to be as natural as fun-loving. And here's my philosophy of 40 years. It's called LEFL, L-E-F-L. It stands for laughter, excitement, fun, and love. So when I'm in my health mode and someone comes to me with a health problem, I go, Juan, when was the last time you laughed? Uh, Steve, I... I don't remember. What do you do for fun? Oh, work. No, you have an ulcer from your work. What do you do for fun? So I check their lephalometer. And the people whose lephalometer is full, they have fewer health problems than than other people. Can you imagine? Mm. I've had people. When was the last time you laughed? I, I, I don't remember when I've laughed. Well, that's a big part of your health challenge at this moment. Mm -hmm. It is being less into, I've got to have this. Guess what? We already have this. You see this massive library? Edgar Cayce, I remember the story of him. He got chastised by his dad. He put his book under his pillow, and he got the whole book downloaded to him when he slept. But we can go one step further. I have had people walk in here, Juan, and put their hand, that's why I don't do it since COVID, we will again, and they absorb all the books. Do I think they did? I know they did. They absorb the key elements of all of these books. We don't have to read. 
We don't have to travel by airplane to get from one area to another. And I'm not just speaking of astral traveling. By location is being in two places with your physical conveyance at the same time. Life and teaching of the masters of the Far East. Now that's set by Baird Spalding is incredible. And years later, people go, oh, it, it had to be poppycock because we haven't found those masters. Baird Spalding wasn't physically in India in those places. No, he was in the ethereal planes. He was with all of those masters. There is so much beyond what our mind is aware of and our brain is aware of. We have instant knowledge to all things. Now, I don't know if that's the answer you expected, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't sell my soul because I can get it for free. Yeah. So I'd no, have to sell my soul. The people I've asked a lot, all of them have said no. And I just, I just coined a new term, interliteral travel. So, I mean, you could travel to other realms in, in the books. And one of the, right, I'd probably be at your library sniffing all the books, Steve. So hopefully you don't I have a you would. I'd be smelling all that knowledge. Because again, I mean, I like to pick up books and just give them, give them a good one. Uh, my only criteria with you, Juan, is you couldn't have eaten Cheetos before you come in here. Because <laughs> that orange stuff would be all over the books. You'd leave a trail here. Yes. You, you had started to bring a, Paris, uh, 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 Manly Hall. And I, I realize I don't know how much more time we have. If you wanted to get into him or uh, that. yeah, so it, it's it's funny you you mentioned the people right touching the books. There's actually a an early early I think it was a newspaper article claiming that Manly P. Hall could sleep next to books and absorb the knowledge. I think it was, and I wanted to ask you what your experience was with Manly and how you got to the point of even working in his alchemical library and, and being able to copy a lot of the books and how 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 did you first meet him can we don't worry about yes. the time i just i want to hear your story on, on oh Hall. okay juan you're the best i'm just telling you that okay so um it was 1978 i began my journey in the metaphysical 1973 and somebody said hey there's this great philosopher He's in Los Feliz, California, which was no more than 20 minutes from where I lived. And so I went on a Friday. Uh, Manly Hall's place is called the Philosophical Research Society. Magnificent place. And every Sunday he lectured for a dollar. But this was a Friday. And every Friday there was a, a lyceum or workshop where the people there would discuss the previous Sunday lecture by Mr. Hall. And so I wandered in there and there was a blackboard on the front with 10 sentences or points. And Pearl Thomas, Mr. Hall's librarian of 50 years was in the front. And another man from Missouri uh, who had studied Mr. Hall for 30 years was in the front. And I, being the brave soul I was, Juan, went as far to the back as I could because I didn't know any of this stuff and just sat with the wall behind me. Well, somebody in the audience said, uh, excuse me, what does point six mean? Now, for whatever reason, Pearl Thomas, the 50-year librarian, puts her finger out into the audience. Everybody's moving their head and she's pointing to me. The next thing I know, everybody was looking at me. I had no idea what I said. I knew I had spoken. And right after that, everything broke up uh, at the end. And Pearl Thomas comes and says, well, how, many manly, how many books have Mr. Hall have you written? Uh, read, I said. Uh, I've never read his book. Well, how many lectures have you been to? I, I, I've never attended a lecture. Well, how, how did you answer what Manley Hall said about that point? She said, young man, because I was young then, Juan. I don't look like it now. I was young. I went the next day, and Pearl Thomas says, who 
you know, who, who are you? What do you want? I said, no, I was just told to come. She said, well, young, young man, here's the key because all his books are locked up behind glass. You have to ask the librarian to unlock. She said, you just take the key, you, whatever you want. Two days later, I have a dream. I wrote it down. The next day I went to Pearl Thomas and I gave her the dream and she gasped and she goes, oh, she gave it to Manley Hall. And the next day he called me up and he said, I want to see you. I want to meet you. So I went over to the Philosophical Research Society and he says, who are you? I said, I'm a student. He said, what do you want? I said, I want to go into your personal private vault that I didn't even know he had, but the words came out, and I want to Xerox alchemical books. Now, why did he say yes? He built the PRS, the Philosophical Research Society, in 1933. I My dream was how he wanted to build it in 1925, but he didn't have enough money, and he settled for what he built in 1933. It was a calling card from the spirit world. I said, I'm a student. That's all. I want to get into your vault. And for nine months, you uh, and um, I'm realizing you have an audio audience, but upstairs here is all the books on alchemy that I Xeroxed out of Manley Hall's vault from the 1450s and 1600s before today's modern time, Juan, when there's been a lot of reprints, but in those days, there weren't. So I was there for six months, met Manley Hall several times in his home. He was an incredible, beautiful individual who walked his talk. And I remember one time I was at his home and he had his shoes on the table. We were talking and his wife came in and she goes, Manley, your shoe has a hole in it. And he goes, he says to her, I can still wear it. I don't need another, I don't need another pair. He was just a really down-to-earth good guy. But people I understood later were calling the PRS going, I'm the Countess Saint Germain. I'm Plato. I'm Jesus Christ. I want to have a personal meeting with Manly All. And the staff people would go, No. So I was very fortunate. My dream was a calling card. People have asked me, what's going to happen to this library? I'm, I'm going to be 75 in January. The right person will come to me, Juan, and give me a sequence of words that I know, and they will be the caretaker in the future. So that's how I met Manly Hall. Now, I'm in this vault, Xeroxing and copying. What is, and Z I, what is Xeroxing, by the way? Oh, oh photocopying. Okay, okay. That's what we called it. Oh my gosh, you've just demonstrated. It sounded that. very alchemical. I thought you were doing something something oh my magical. Gosh, with them. It's photo were you copy. sniffing them? Did you sniff them, Steve? At that time, no. I was so busy having the opportunity to photocopy. I was just photocopying left and right. And I found a little notebook in his inner vault said. Last sec material that arrived too late to be included in the big book, Secret Teaching of All Ages. And it was a notebook. And I said, I asked him, and he said, look, anything you find in this vault, I wish that you would not reprint anything because this is how the Philosophical Research Society makes its money on reprinting old books. Well, I've waited 40, 40 some years. The PRS never did it. So I decided to reprint without changing anything, this material that arrived too late to be included into uh, his big book, The Secret Teaching of All Ages and Times. I have a PDF copy. I'm going to pick up a physical copy. And no, you're going to be mailed. You, you give me your mailing address when we're off, and you will receive as many of those as you want, my friend. 
Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. And Steve, so what was what was that like? I mean, can you take us back? What did you learn anything from looking at these? Because there's something about looking at alchemical plates, and I have the the I usually read late in bed on a tablet, and sometimes I'll be doing research on alchemy. I talk about it a lot on the show, and I feel like. A lot of these alchemical plates were mandalas. I mean, they were devices to open up your consciousness, open yourself up. And whenever I go to sleep, be right after reading or looking at alchemical plates, I have very weird dreams, very odd dreams. Did you pick anything up from these books that you were? He said as late as the 14th century, was it the alchemical text? Because he had quite the collection. Well, yeah, because those were the printed were the 15, 16 uh, hundreds where the alchemical books. No, it, this is really funny because you're not going to expect this. Um, one time I'm in his vault and I pick up a book and Juan, I knew that was my book from that time period. I knew that it, that physical book was my book. And I went through such angst of whether I should steal, walk out with it and steal it. I know <laughs> I'm just admitting exactly what happened. It was so strong. I go, what the heck? This is my, this is my book. Now, not that I wrote the book. I physically had that book and i had to control myself going what steve what, what are you doing now what you were asking happened when i was in the castle of the alchemist in in uh germany and when i would hold these different parchments and scrolls before written books and in that castle were floor to ceiling on the coffee table, open Paris. It, it was an incredible. Was it in book. Prague, Steve? It, it, it was all, all the books in there. I, I was getting downloads. I was in this castle three days, and I was getting downloads and dreams. Every time I would touch something, I would get images. So, uh, yes, that is exact. That didn't happen at Manly Hall because I was a man on a mission. I was zero. In fact, no. You mentioned our beautiful friend at the very beginning who introduced you and I. He and I are really the only two people who are allowed. And I was in Manley Hall's vault 20 years before him, Xeroxing, going back and forth. My eyesight, I'm wearing glasses now because I couldn't close the top of the machines on a book from 1600 and destroy the binding. So I had to turn away and Xerox and copy continuously. I, I did, I photocopied my brains out for however, I, I was there maybe four or five months. I didn't have time. I was a man on a mission. And I was lucky because when World Research was out there, the World Research Foundation, people are going, what an unbelievable place. There's alchemical books, which were not easy to get. There weren't really reprints. Uh, something called the Rife Microscope, which is very rare, and other things that I received from spiritual guidance. And that elevated our organization to, uh, to great heights, more than me, maybe we deserved, because we were very new, um, because of the... Zero photocopied materials from from Manly Hall. So I'm a caretaker. Uh, let's get that straight. I don't feel I own these things, Juan. I am a caretaker. Plain and simple. I've met people over the years for 20 minutes. And 10 years later, when they passed away, I had a call mm. from a man. I moved from... Um, Granada Hills near L.A. to Sedona. I get a call. Is this Steve Ross? Yes. Can you prove you're Steve Ross? Well, yeah, I have a driver's license. No. Can you prove you were at 15300 Ventura Boulevard, Sherman Oaks, California? 
how am I going to prove that? Uh, I, I got rid of all my utilities because I live in Sedona. How about if I send you press clippings? Okay. Who are you? I'm a lawyer. My client passed away and in her will left you a big box. I have no idea what's in the box, but it's got your address in Sherman Oaks, California. This has happened five or six times over the last 40 years. We caretake. I don't want to put you on the spot, Steve, but I believe what you were doing by interacting with Manly and it plays into the theory that I mentioned at the beginning where if, right, alchemy, the manipulation of symbols, the manipulation of matter on a physical level and metaphysical level. Well, by you aligning yourself and doing the things that you did, you were conducting alchemy and you were aligning certain things at a certain point in time, therefore elevating your organization and yourself to a certain point through the use of alchemy. And I want to ask you also, what were you doing for work during this whole time, Steve? Uh, I started the World Research Foundation. I was asked at the time if I wanted to stay at the PRS. I, I made a couple presentations there, but I had a dream to start a worldwide health organization. It was a I saw a world map with blinking lights, and that was in 1980, and I was to put offices or get advisors there, and I started with my co-founder in 1984, set up the World Research Foundation, and that was my line of work, being a consultant, going around, making presentations, um, going to the jungles of Bali, um, going to prestigious institutions, coming back and giving presentations to NBC and ABC and CBS or hospital associations, um, radio stations. And that was my profession. It was a nonprofit and we sold information packets and that allowed me to do it, have a magic life. I, I, I have a magic, magic life. I am blessed. I've done healing work. I've never charged because I have been blessed by spirit. I've been blessed by to, to live a life like this. And, and I appreciate it. Yeah. And no, almost definitely. Cause right. Uh, me and my friends have this joke where it's the, the secret that Manly P hall had right Not bashing Manly P hall, but he did kind of sort of have a sugar mama, right? That left him. He quite... had a sugar mama who <laughs> left him the royalties to this oil well, but only up to a certain age and not to his death. Interesting. But I mean, and, he built himself up after the fact. Yes, but, but I know because I was over there, they really went through a very hard time because that those royalties stopped. And the foundation, he had passed away, um, and they didn't know what to do for a while. But they've they've come out. But you're exactly right. He had a sugar mama, and of course, my World Research Foundation had two sugar people. But that would be another <laughs> day, another discussion that allowed me to do healing work with people and never charge, do consulting work and never charge wow so steve the the secrets to this alchemical recipe is the art of the sugar mama so <laughs> we're gonna have to gonna have to work it's, on that <laughs> that's exactly right we need to talk about that for you but they're there and when you're open when you're loving when you look to do your best now i i need to share another dream with you and this dream was i was walking uh, near the ocean, to my left was the ocean, all the seekers of the world and I were together on the sand, left ocean, in front was a woman in blue, she had a microphone, and as I got close, it was Sophia, the god of wisdom, to my right was horseshoe stands of people who have written books, and the courses, and the new age, and all of these things, but smoke and fog was coming out of their mouths and obliterating 
this woman. And then I looked and I recognized many of these people in the stands. I'm not saying they're good or bad. I'm just saying the smoke, they were obliterating Sophia. And I thought to myself, what a, what a, what a, a savage people supposed to do for enlightenment? And a big breeze blew off the ocean and cleared everything away. And here were the words I said, all that anybody needs is a beautiful heart, an open mind, and a humble spirit. You don't need books. You don't need gurus. You don't need fancy jargon. A beautiful heart, an open mind, and a humble spirit. And I've tried to, to walk that path as much as I can, realizing the gifts that we're given that are beyond our ego and our personality. Absolutely. And there's two last questions for you, Steve. What Make was, them easy, please, Juan. <laughs> what was the your favorite book that you copied from Manly Hall's Alchemical oh, Library? Oh, oh, that would be... If you had to narrow it down, Steve. <laughs> if you had to pick one. Oh, my gosh. It, it, it was a book on Paracelsus. It was a book, trans, Transmutation of the Metals, 1657, even though Paracelsus lived. That was when the English edition was translated from the German. Paracelsus. I, I believe it was six. Uh, hey, I can, uh, I eventually ended up getting the physical book. 30 years later, or 20 years later, after that Xerox copy, which I have behind me. But it was Transmutation of the Metals by Paracelsus. Interesting. And my last question to you is going to be, what, right, if you could leave us with a book today that you would recommend people read, but I'm sure that you'd have a hard time thinking about that too, if you had to pick I one book. I, I would tell people to pick up the, the book called The Kabbalion. Are, are you familiar with that? K-Y-B, yeah. the, the Kabbalion. Why? Because it transcends all of the religions, all of the philosophies, but it gives you the foundation of everything. It's a, yeah. And the reason, there may be better books with more technical, but I just like that. It was written by the three initiates or Yogi Ramachakra, but uh, I like that little book, The Kabbalion. Yeah, I've read it a couple times. I am familiar with it. So, For more yeah, advanced the people, it may not make a difference. I, I'm not sure of your audience, although listening to you and meeting you for the first time, you have a very sophisticated, I'm sure, audience. Yeah, there. This is this is more of a think tank, Steve. This is yes more advanced material that I cover on my show, and I mean not that I don't cover basic stuff, but yeah, my my people are pretty advanced as far as yeah. the knowledge goes. Steve, I'm gonna have to have you back on because I know we left a lot on the table, and I'd love to have you on the occult book club to break down an occult or esoteric book of of you can pick it and. So if you could pick something super mind blowing, Steve, that no one's no one's had or heard about, that'd be awesome. And I'd, I'd like right. to invite you. On I, that I show. will start thinking about that. And Juan, <clears throat> I want to thank you again. I never take any interviewer person for granted that you gave me an opportunity to share what I've been doing over the last 50 years. So I thank you for that. Absolutely, Stephen. I thank you for your time. Shout out to Ronnie Pontiac. Again, American Metaphysical Religion. Make sure to pick that up. I did an episode with him. I can't recall which number it was. But yeah, Steve, can you plug your stuff again for the people where they can find you? If you have social media, let them know where they can find your website as well. And I'll post the links in the description either way. But I always like for the for the guests to say it again over the air. Yes, uh, the spiritual Philosophical information is at lesscomplicated.net. Health information, uh, every alternative possibility for a health challenge is at wrf.org, World Research Foundation. 
And I have videos, short videos and presentations at on YouTube at Less Complicated with Dr. Stephen A. Ross. Um, and that would be the materials. Awesome, Steve. This was great. I had a fun time. And I'm sure my audience will be seeing you again. So hopefully they, they enjoyed this as much as I did. Thank you again, Steve. Take and as care. always, everyone, see you on the other side.